I'm an Iowa State fan and a Hawkeye fan, and I know they start at 2.30. I hate to tell you, I won't be done with this program by 2.30. But if I see you checking your phones, I won't take offense, okay? Um, I want to start, uh, the program will be divided down into three parts, and I'll kind of let you know, because the first part will be about how I got involved in this, uh, a little about me, and then how the rise of the Nazis took place, the history of, of that particular period of time. The second part will be survivors that I have met, many that I call friends, and their stories. And I think you'll find it very interesting. The third part is a short video, about a 15 to 20 minute video from the Jewish Foundation for the Righteous that takes a person, a survivor, finds the person that was responsible for rescuing them and brings them to New York City for the first time since that conflict. And it's one of the most inspirational things I've ever seen. I'll finish with a short music video if you have questions, and then we'll go check and see what the third quarter score is. <laughs> okay. First, I want you to understand something. I, I'm a, a, high, a high school and middle school social, social studies teacher of over 40 years. I started in 1975 uh, down at Albia. I went to Eagle Grove. I spent most of my public education time in, in Lorenz Marathon, about 23, 24 years there. And then I figured out how I could make money as a teacher because I retired from public education, started collecting IPERS, and went to teach full-time in the Catholic school system at Storm Lake St. Mary's. Okay, and that worked pretty well. We then moved down to Ankeny. I was a girls basketball coach at Ankeny, so I coached against the Marshalltown girls here for a couple of years. And I found that it was a little bit different. It was like the school that I was at in Storm Lake had 67 kids in high school that I went to Ankeny, and it was like going from Earth to Jupiter. <laughs> and uh, all of a sudden, I was old enough and wise enough to realize I didn't need the hassle. Okay? I'm not Jewish. Okay? I wasn't raised Jewish. I don't... You know, I've come into contact with a lot of survivors, but before this, it didn't. Um, in 2009, as was mentioned, I needed to renew my teaching certificate. You have to take six hours. Six, right? <laughs> you have to take six. I told you I didn't teach math. You have to take six hours. So a flyer came across my desk that the Illinois Holocaust Museum was offering three graduate credits for a class on the Holocaust, and I was interested. So I went out there. I went out there with the intention of being able to bring something back to teach to my high school kids, but the first three days were filled with so much death and hate and destruction and violence, I thought, I can't take that back to a high school. But on the fourth day, we started talking about liberation. We started talking about some of the greatest acts of human kindness that humanity may have ever seen. I went back to Storm Lake St. Mary's, I developed a semester-long class which the school allowed me to teach, probably the only one in the state of Iowa. And I taught uh, Holocaust and genocide education. Okay. <clears throat> the next summer, there are 15 centers in the United States. How many of you have been to the U.S. Holocaust Museum? Okay. Magnificent building, huge. And you didn't get enough, spend enough time there, did you? Because I've taken students there. They'll give you a passport, you get on an elevator, you start looking for an identity, you go up three floors, and you could spend days on each floor, okay? Have any of you been to the Illinois Holocaust Museum? If this is a topic of interest, it's a lot closer, and I will get to that uh, during my program, okay? But there are 15 Holocaust centers in the United States. Those are two of the 15 recognized by the Jewish Foundation for the Righteous, and what those 15 centers have the ability to do is nominate two people. So there are 30 people in the United States that have a chance to go and study this topic further. Well, I was fortunate enough, I got to go study at Columbia University and meet some of the best scholars in the world on this topic. Many from Europe. The person that's in charge of the Osage Birkenau site today was there. There was a person from the United Nations that was there in every meeting that we had as well as scholars from Northwestern University in Canada and Europe and all around, and survivors. The next year after that, I got selected again to be one of two people to go study with the Jewish Foundation for the Righteous in Newark, New Jersey. So what started off as, I need three hours to get my credit, all of a sudden became a life passion. I still substitute teach, 
But I would do this in a heartbeat over substitute teaching. <laughs> it's becoming a little bit more like, a little bit more like babysitting, and, and my wife does that. I don't do that. She cares for two-year-olds 10 hours a day down at principal daycare in Des Moines. And I couldn't do that. So anyway, we live in a world where all you have to do is wake up in the morning, read the newspaper, get on Facebook, or turn on the radio or TV, and you're going to find death, Destruction, violence, hatred, anger, on a daily basis. I'm going to give you an option. There's another world here that's filled with hope and love and care and compassion and justice. And by the time we get done with this program, I'm going to bring this back up, I hope. We've got to decide which of these worlds are we going to build. Which of these worlds are we going to allow to survive? Because the period of time I'm talking about today, the people over here, the good people over here, allowed this side to run rampant with hatred and violence and anger and destruction and death. We know that to be true, right? OK. All right. So that's a good introduction, because usually my screen will fall asleep, and that means I went about five or 10 minutes too long. Okay. When I went out in 2010, uh, 2009, I'd been teaching social studies for 35 years, and there were two things I wanted to believe about this topic. One was that in the United States, we must not have known what was going on, or we would have taken care of it and fixed it. We would have helped. Somehow we would have you know, shown compassion. And we're going to find out that that's not true. We knew as early as 1933, when Hitler became chancellor, we knew when the Nuremberg Laws were passed in 35. We are on this very day today. November 10th, celebrating the 80th anniversary of Kristallnacht, which I'll get into in a little bit, which is going to change the entire structure of this Holocaust from a bad law to life-threatening for Jewish people in Europe. I do want you to understand one thing. This is not a Jewish problem alone. There are millions, about 6 million Jews were killed. And if you were Jewish, they were trying to kill you, without any doubt. But Roma centers, uh, homosexuals, handicapped, political dissidents, there are at least five million other groups of people that are also going to be killed in the Holocaust. So I don't want you leaving today thinking that. I don't want you leaving today thinking that all Germans were Nazis. That's not true. They weren't all bad. But the problem that existed at this period of time is... If a non-Nazi started to challenge a Nazi, you're probably going to prison or you're being killed. So the only thing you have the ability to do is maintain a sense of silence as if you were a bystander and allow evil to continue. And I understand that problem that kind of existed with them. Okay? So, we knew what was taking place. In 1938, Roosevelt is going to hold a conference in Evian, France, with 28 other nations around the world to talk about the problem of Europe and that the Nazis are creating. And they're going to spend a week in Europe, and then all those leaders are going to go home, and nothing's going to change. Good intentions don't get the job done. Okay? And if you've been to the U.S. Holocaust Museum, which a number of you have, and if you come out the mall side, you'll see inscribed in the walls, Eisenhower has a script there of which the last two words are, never again. You've heard that about this topic, right? Never again, never again. In 2009, when I left the museum, they told me there were 26 places on the face of the earth where a genocide has, is, or will be taking place. And we've seen it. We've seen it in Rwanda, South Sudan, many, many places on the earth in our lifetime, in the recent history. For our sake, a genocide is when one group of people has the ability to wipe the other group completely off the face of the earth. What the Nazis wanted to do was make it so that all Jewish history was non-existent. So if I was talking today to you and I said something about Jewish or Hebrew, you wouldn't have a clue what I'm talking about. I might as well be talking Martian to you. Okay? And we know they did not accomplish that goal, but that was the goal. How in the world can bad things happen? 
How could they happen like this? This is going to be our center circle of care and compassion in our life. Okay? So I want you to think in your own life, who's going to be in the center of that circle? Your volunteers, you want me to just go? Your family, very close. You're very close. I'm not even saying you're wrong. But it's got to be you. It's got to be you. Okay? That sounds a little conceited. But listen to me. If you are not the best version, if I am not the best version of myself that I can be, everyone around me is trying to fix me while they're broken. If I can become a better version of myself, I can help the world move in a positive direction. If you don't get anything else out of this, and we've been here less than 15 minutes, so I hope I don't waste the rest of your day. But if you don't get anything else out of this, please do me this favor. I want you to find some time daily. Every day, I don't care if it's seconds, minutes, hours. I don't care if it's in the morning, afternoon, evening. I don't care when you figure it out. But we need to spend time individually to improve ourselves mentally, physically, and spiritually every day. Every day. So we can be the best version. My wife's sitting in the back of the room. If I'm an abusive husband, she's spending all of her time trying to fix me. She can't help our kids and our grandkids. You know? So hopefully that makes sense to you. Gandhi couldn't free India of British rule if he fasts and dies. I mean, all of his friends are saying, you, can't, you gotta eat, you can't, you can't die on us, we need you, okay? Second circle, I agree with you 100%, family. I was a coach and a teacher my whole life. So I knew 95% of the people were going to dislike me greatly. <laughs> you're laughing, <laughs> you haven't been a coach and a teach. If you had been, you'd be sitting there going, I know what you're going through. Well, you think about it. All the opposing fans, opposing players, opposing coaches, and the officials dislike you greatly. At least half your parents dislike you greatly because you're not making their kid a star. And the kids that are sitting on the bench and aren't on the floor are disliking you because I'm better than him. Okay? I could live with that. I knew going into coaching, it wasn't going to be real popular and fun. But when an administrator started to attack my wife... He didn't know what fury meant. <laughs> As a matter of fact, when I went in his office that day, he says, I got to get somebody else in here. I wasn't going to hurt him, but I was going to try to make him rethink his thought process. And I think he was afraid of how much effort that was going to take on my part. <laughs> I'm not sure. But I guess you would feel the same way about your family. I can take the heat for being an idiot and stupid and all the things he may want to call me. But don't say it about my kids, my grandkids, or my wife. Because I know for certain I didn't marry an idiot. We've got ourselves, we've got our family real quickly. Close friends. How about close friends? Those friends that you could call at two in the morning if you've got a flat tire. Now, there's probably only two or three or four of them in your life. Maybe there's one. Maybe there's none. You've got to find somebody in case you have that emergency. Okay. okay. Can we get to circle four? We've already got ourselves, our family, close friends, neighbors. neighbors, acquaintances, maybe people that are in the same class, maybe the people in the same neighborhood that you're not real friendly with, but you care about. You don't want somebody breaking into their property, you know, okay? Can we get beyond that? Can we get to like maybe a, a little larger community, like maybe a church community or a school community or a town? You guys have gone through horrendous situation in the last few months and I think what you normally will see and I hope this is what's taking place is that the community is pulling together to help each other out in this time of need right so can we get to circle six maybe a region in the United States maybe it's soybean farmers worried about prices or tariffs or various things okay can we get to circle seven? Can we get to total strangers living in some other area of the world that we should be concerned about? Let's say, as an example, in the 1930s, 
Jewish or handicapped or Roma Sintas, gypsies in Europe? Should we have been concerned about them as if they were our neighbors, our family, or our friends? Now, there's no way in the world, and I'm not trying to say this, there's no way in the world that anybody's going to care about these people as much as they care about these people. But there is something I do want you to understand. There are an awful lot of people in the United States today that if it's not good for them, their family, and their close friends, they could care less whether you live or die. If it's not good for them, their race, their religion, their nationality, you, you put the names in here. But you understand what I'm saying. So if we're going to advance goodness in the world beyond where it already exists in our life, we're going to have to step out to circle four and five. And I'm guessing in this community, and this is the first community I've ever spoke in, which has just suffered a natural disaster like you guys did. But my guess is many of you have already stepped out to circle four and five. And that's good. And that's what greatness is. But should we wait for a natural disaster to do that? You following? Sometimes we have to have that wake-up call. I understand that. But at the end of this meeting, I hope you're thinking about how you can expand your circle of goodness to include either strangers, people in need, through random acts of kindness, through whatever it might take, to keep goodness in the world, that rippling effect of goodness, traveling through the waters of, of freedom and hope. Okay? All right, now we're to the stuff I leave out of my middle school program, because I know they're going to fall asleep on me. <laughs> you guys are here by choice. Hopefully I won't bore you too much. But I think it's important to understand a bit of history. At the end of World War I, Germany's going to be claimed for all of World War I. And they have to pay reparations to all the rest of the world for the damage that was occurring. Okay? The Treaty of Versailles is going to be, uh, it's going to set up the Weimar Republic, a constitutional government in which von Hindenburg is going to be elected president. He's a great guy, but he's pretty old. Okay? He's fought in wars. The Weimar Constitution. Now, one of the problems and one of the things that most people are going to say is, why such a hatred of the Jewish religion? I wish I could just give you one single thing and say that was it. But it kind of mounts up over a period of time. If you go back to ancient biblical times, the Hebrews, the Jews, were very good with money as tax collectors. They're very good businessmen. So they probably were a bit wealthier than the average European at the time. Some people don't like that. They're jealous of that. Okay? But there were a number of Jewish people on the committee to help write this Weimar Constitution. Right? In 1923, Adolf Hitler, with some of his cronies, decided they were going to overthrow the Weimar Republic. It wasn't working very effectively. One of the things that had happened was they had printed money at a faster rate than the value could extend. There are people in the United States today who say, why don't we just pay off our debt, just print, print a few trillion dollars and put it out there. <laughs> the problems that that creates are unbelievable, and I'll get to a few of them as far as inflation in just a few moments. Okay. So anyway, the Weimar Republic wasn't working real effectively. They, they were still in major debt, there was still major unemployment, inflation, people were struggling. But Adolf Hitler's ability to overthrow the government got put down. He got arrested. While in jail, he writes the book Mein Kampf, My Struggle. It becomes the guideline for the Nazi program to come. And pretty soon, there are a number of people in Germany that see him as a rising star. Now, I want you to realize in the late 1920s, the Nazi party was one of about 10 to 12 political parties in Germany. And they had about 2.9% of the vote. They are non-existent. They couldn't do anything good or evil. Okay? That's going to change. Part of what's going to change it is going to be propaganda, which is in the next slide. Part of it's going to be the Great Depression. We know here in the United States the Great Depression was terrible. But let me give you a couple examples of how in Germany... And in Europe, the Great Depression hit. 
I'm going to suggest, and I'm going to give you condolences because I know your husband uh, was killed in World War I. And you have a 10,000 mark, their money, I'm going to use dollars just for common sake, but you've got a $10,000 insurance policy on him. And so as sad as that is, at least you want to collect money so you've got some spending. So you're going to fill out a registration with the insurance company. You're going to mail it to this nice insurance lady sitting right next to you. You're going to put a three cent stamp on it. I like it when kids go, what's that? That's what, that's what we used to use for mail. And so somebody in there says, oh yeah, most of you are too young, I understand. Okay, and you're going to mail that. And six months later, after she looks at it, gets it approved and everything, you get your $10,000 back. Yeah. You're welcome. Here's what I want you to know. Six months later, the $10,000 doesn't have the buying power of the three cent stamp. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I used to play in a band in the 60s and we played at the El Dorado. Anybody remember the El Dorado in downtown here, Marshalltown right across from the courthouse? See, I am old. <laughs> But I'm going to say uh, a nice steakhouse here in town. How much is it going to cost? Just me. I'm not taking my wife. She doesn't like steak. I'll let her, I'll let her eat some vegetables or something. $25, $20, $50. Give me a number. It doesn't matter. $25. Give me $25. Okay. So if I go into a steakhouse in Germany after the Great Depression, early 1930s, I sit down at a restaurant. I look at the menu. I see a $25 steak. That's what I want. I'm going to give it to the waitress. She's going to give it to the cook. The cook's going to cook it, give it back to the waitress. Waitress brings it to me. I eat. Then I'm going to go pay my bill. Sound pretty familiar. Isn't that what we do? All right. Here's what I want to know. How much time from the time I sit down and decide on my order till I leave the restaurant? Just give me a number. Hour. An hour. Hour. Thank you. That makes it easy for me. <laughs> I, I told you. <laughs> oh, yeah, one point one five. Yeah. All of a sudden, I went from liking you to thinking, wait a minute. <laughs> one hour. My $25 steak is now, when I leave the restaurant, they're going to say, 90, between 90 and $100. It'll cost me. Because prices were tripling and quadrupling in the hour. Let me give you one other example, and then I'll get off this topic. After the Great Depression, in Germany, how many marks would it take to create the buying power of one U.S. dollar? 2.3 million. 2.3 million marks would equal one dollar in the United States. The Depression was bad for us. I think we can see how desperate they are. They're looking for a leader that's going to promise them greatness. They're looking for a leader that's going to get them out of this problem. And Hitler happens to be that guy. And as I get to him becoming chancellor in 1933, what's going to happen is the Nazi party is going to start to gain control of Germany. I told you before the Great Depression, late 1920s, they had 2.9% of the vote. By 1933, they have 47.8% of the public that is a Nazi supporting the program that Adolf Hitler has put out. And I'll get to part of how that happens in a moment. But he becomes chancellor in January of 1933. Within a month after becoming chancellor, and chancellor in Germany would be almost like vice president in the United States. Okay, he's second after von Hindenburg. The Reichstag is going to burn within a month. The Reichstag is their capital. They're going to blame it on communist left, leftists. Um, but we don't know for any certainty who burned the Reichstag. But we do know the result. Because as soon as that burned, Hitler is going to be given enumerated enabling powers. Enabling powers. He's able to now use the military to his advantage for what he believes is a necessity. A little bit of danger involved here, isn't there? And if you look, within the next year... Hindenburg dies, as soon as he dies, he declares himself not only chancellor but president. He becomes the Fuhrer. The Nazis are in charge. They've got the voting power in the, in the country. 
and they're off and running. In 1935, they create the Nuremberg Laws. The Nuremberg Laws are going to be the first of a series of laws um, denying Jews citizenship. They're going to make being Jewish a race of people like Caucasian or African. Jewish is no longer a religion. They no longer would be able to do business with normal Germans. Their kids will no longer go to public school. They can't go to parks. Okay? It's the first of a series of discriminatory laws that are going to take place. In between 1929 and 1935, most of the Jewish people in Germany are thinking, well, this, this is bad. It's really bad, but it's not going to get worse. And I fought in World War I for this country. I grew up in this country. I've been in this country my whole life. I'm not leaving because somebody's making stupid laws. We'll get it figured out. And then 80 years ago today, or 80 years ago last night, the 9th, because on the 9th and the 10th, we'll see Kristallnacht. Who in here knows what Kristallnacht is? A few. A young 18-year-old Jewish boy whose parents are in a camp is going to get a letter from them talking about the terrible conditions. He decides he's going to kill a high German diplomat. He goes to the German embassy in Paris with the intention of killing a high German official. He's going to kill von Roth, a German guard, and as a result of that, that's all Hitler needs to carry out a pogrom which says we're going to burn, they burned over a thousand synagogues. They destroyed businesses, they broke windows out of businesses, they rounded up Jewish men and started taking them away to camp or beating them or just automatically just killing them. And what was a bad series of laws in this period of time now is life-threatening. Okay. Germany invades Poland on September 1st, 1939, and World War II begins. Okay. Now, how did they get from 2.9% to 48.7%? Part of it was he hired a propaganda minister, Goebbels, who did an excellent job. I want the females in the room to think about being back in high school and you're looking for a prom date. What do you think, this guy or this guy? Oh, I like this guy. <laughs> Jews are going to be depicted as the lowest living form of life. Goebbels is going to hire a guy, Stryker, to write a book, a children's book called The Poisoned Mushroom. Now, those of you who go mushroom hunting, you realize there are poisonous mushrooms out there you stay away from. And in this children's book, these are the poisonous mushrooms. Don't go near them. Don't go talk to them. If you see one, run away. And they're doing this at the level where we started with our Dick and Jane reader books, for those of you that are old enough to understand. So by the time they are six, seven, eight, or nine years old, they already know these people are like the devil, and we've got to avoid them at all costs. Okay? It makes it pretty easy for Hitler to start youth groups because young kids want to join a group and now they all have something in common, a hatred of Jewish people to start with. They're going to be picked on in school, so forth and so on. Okay. I took this chart. This chart is personal to me. Because my mom was born in the United States in 1927, handicapped. My mom was born with an ar a left arm. It's two-thirds the size of her right arm, and her hand is closed. She went through numerous operations, but still like that. Okay? When we were going to grand, grandparents, either my wife or my parents, our kids at different times would say, are we going to this grandma's or the other grandma's? Okay? But if she'd have been born in Germany in 1927, after the Nazis took power between 1935 and, and forth, she would have been sent to a doctor to, got, to be getting fixed. 
And her parents, in two to, weeks to a month, probably would receive a letter saying, we're so sorry that your daughter has died due to complications and surgery. And in actuality, what's going to happen is she's going to be euthanized in a T4 program. And you can see that they're figuring we can save about 9 million marks because handicapped, mentally handicapped or physically handicapped people will never amount to more than they're going to cost society. So let's cut our losses and just get rid of them to start with. Okay. <clears throat> things I want you to understand. Everything the Germans did was legal according to their law. They didn't break any laws in all of the terrible things that occurred. Secondly, everything that they did had been done before in history with the exception of the gas chamber being used to kill human beings. That's the only thing they came up with. All the other things, you can go back to the Old Testament and start finding anti-Semitism. Okay? So, where do you think they got the idea of creating ghettos to round up Jews in a town and take them to the poorest section of town and get them from the countryside and put them in these overpopulated poor areas of a community? It came from the United States. It came from Native Americans. What did we do? We took Native Americans off their fertile farm and hunting grounds and put them out in a desert area hoping that they will die so we don't have to deal with the problem. I'm a history teacher. That was one of the toughest things for me to try to teach and try to explain how our ancestors could treat other humans this way. But it becomes fairly simple for them for a couple of reasons. One, they want to be able to identify the Jewry in Europe. And secondly, if they have them in ghettos, now they have a workforce that they don't have to pay, already in containment. And later on, if they want to get rid of them, they know where they're at, they can put them on trains, and they can get them to where they need to be pretty quickly. Okay. Now, the largest of the ghettos is the Warsaw Ghetto. Have any of you seen The Zookeeper's Wife, the movie about the Warsaw Zoo? Great movie, well done, pretty accurate. Okay. The Warsaw Ghetto is the other one that had an uprising that lasted for a little over a month before they decided to burn it down, okay? How big in geographic area is Marshalltown? I know I didn't come in here thinking you were having a quiz today. I'm a teacher. <laughs> Maybe three miles by three miles. Three by three. All right, I'm gonna cut it back. I'm gonna say it's the same size as the Warsaw Ghetto, two and a half. We're gonna make it simple, wow. okay? How many people in Marshalltown? 27,000. Okay, here's the good news. Tonight, when you go to bed, we are crystal knock, so let's hope nobody knocks on your door and decides to grab all the men or all the people and, and break everything up. You've had enough of that already taking place through natural problems. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to drop 470,000 more people into this community. No more water, food, shelter, no more jobs, no more housing, no more medicine, no more doctors. Because in the Warsaw Ghetto, the worst area of Warsaw, in that two and a half square miles, at its height, there are 500,000 people in that two and a half square miles. So we'll take about twice the population of the city of Des Moines and just pop them in here overnight and we'll see how the fun begins. Okay? Now life in the ghetto is awful. It's so bad that like today we have garbage carts, they had death carts. And what they, you'd do is you'd take a person that died in the building and set them outside and the death cart would come and take them out of town and either bury them or burn them depending upon the disease or what it caused their death. Okay. So life in the ghetto was almost unbearable. But before this is all said and done, they're going to come to the conclusion that this is the only place where they're not going to be killed. They might die from overwork, lack of food, no medicine, disease, whatever. You could die from any of a series of natural causes, but at least the Nazis aren't coming inside the ghetto and killing the Jews. They're going to transport them out. If you try to go into hiding, if you try to escape, death is what waits for you. December 7th, 1941, the war changes. Japan decides to bomb Pearl Harbor. The United States is going to get actively involved. And we know that that has a direct effect upon this program because 
A conference is held in Wannsee of all high German officials with the exception of Hitler. He's not going to be there. That way he can't be blamed. He's going to put Heydrich and Himmler and his other generals in charge of figuring out how they can eliminate the 11 million Jews that are in Europe, according to their estimations on this chart. Now, prior to the Wannsee Conference, people had been dying from all different things, but how had the Nazis been killing people? Shooting them. Over 1.5 million shot in Poland and the Ukraine. We're still uncovering burial sites with just massive bodies. But what they came to the conclusion is, we'll never be able to get rid of 11 million people by shooting them. Okay, we've got to figure something out. And while we'll never see anything written with Hitler's name on it and the terms final solution, after this conference, these six extermination camps went into construction. Now, they had all been labor camps. They were already existing, but now what's going to take place is they're going to start building gas chambers and crematoriums. And according to the Jewish Foundation for the Righteous, these are the number of people that are going to be killed in each of these six. Now, I realize there are gas chambers at Dachau and some of the other camps. But according to the Jewish Foundation for the Righteous, Trains didn't bring people in for the sole purpose of eliminating them in those camps. These are the six camps where that took place. Those were used for people that were already existing there, more likely. All right. On April 29, 1945, the United States soldiers are going to liberate Dachau. We liberated three camps, Dachau, Buchenwald, and I can't remember the third. Most of the camps are going to be liberated by the Soviets coming in in the east because those camps are in the far east of Germany and Poland and Ukraine and so forth. But I have actual photographs of this event sitting right over here. And you'll see them up here. These are not taken from a movie or a book. When I was teaching in Eagle Grove in the 1980s, Tony Tomke was a student teacher of mine. His father took these pictures. Now, you do have to remember something. First of all, Dachau was not an extermination camp, but there is death in all the camps. Okay. Secondly, our soldiers had seen the horrors of war, but they were not prepared for this. I've met two people that entered this camp. They both say they still have nightmares. One came in the back. The other came in the front, and he said, before you got to the gates, there were 29 railway cars, and when they opened up the cars, bodies just fell out. Just dead bodies of 29 cars that never made it into Dachau. So I'm going to flip through these fairly quickly. Imagine being a, a GI, coming up on people who are starving and decimated. Aren't you going to want to give them food? But if we gave them food, that potentially killed them because they couldn't digest normal nutrition. Definitely would give them severe diarrhea and, and malnutrition would take place. And, but I mean, how could, I mean, it's next to impossible to know how we could even help almost. It's hard to look at a picture like that and not think of this as an extermination camp, isn't it? Now, typhus was a disease that wiped an awful large portion of this out. This camp was actually burned, and it's been rebuilt now as a memorial. You can go to Dachau today. I'm going to spend a moment on this term, Musulman. It's not a term we use very often. But a Musulman or a Musulmaner is a person that is physically still alive, his heart is beating, he's breathing, but he is spiritually and mentally dead. He's going to pass away. It's just a matter of time. He's refusing to eat anymore. I had a dear friend from Eagle Grove, Kerry Fakus, that was in hospice, that I knew once he stopped eating, it was over. I had a brother, 
seven years younger than myself. Uh, slipped into a coma. He'd had cancer. We put him in hospice, and the family's belief was he would pass away within a day or two. It was more than two weeks later, and my brother never left that room. And he was swearing at Brett. He says, please, just go. I mean, you know, there's no... But here's something that we need to understand. The physical body will do everything it can to avoid death. You see those starving kids in Africa and their bellies popped out and we're thinking, oh, they're just eating too much ice cream and candy and their arms are about this big. That's not true. The body's storing fat to use as fuel so that it doesn't die. Okay? During the Holocaust, thousands of Jews, Christians, Muslims risked their lives to save strangers. After the invasion of Poland, few Jews gave serious thought to survival outside the ghetto. They clung to a false hope that as bad as things were, it wouldn't get worse, yet it did. And choices, choices. Some highly responsible person in this room is going to bring me back to choices, choices later in the program. I've got two examples for those of you that are adults of choices, choices that I hope no human ever has to make. After the war was over, these survivors had nowhere to go. They, couldn't, they went back home and there were no Jews living there and their Jewish property was in the hands of Germans. If you remember the movie Schindler's List, at the end they'll say, well, you can't go east, but don't go west either. They're going to be in displaced person camps for a period of time, maybe up until the early 52 or 53. Okay. But a lot of them ended up coming to the United States. Most of them wanted to go to Israel. And the new independent state of Israel was created in 1948 for that purpose. But most of them never told a soul of the horrors that they'd been through. The last survivor I will show you, that's a dear friend of mine, David Wolnerman. His son Michael was 18 years old, asking his father, what's the number on your arm? He says, oh, that's the number of girls I dated in high school. He still didn't know his father had been at Auschwitz. Well, now, the reason I bring this up with this slide is because in 1978, the Nazis decide they're going to march in Skokie, Illinois. Now, Skokie was chosen because Skokie had the largest percent of the town where Holocaust survivors are Jews. It's a northwest suburb of Chicago, okay? And it's where the museum is today at 9603 Woods Drive. Uh, so they decided well, we need to march where the Jews that we didn't kill are at. As a matter of fact, Frank Collins came on public TV and said, the only mistake we made is we didn't kill you all. And they got the parade permit to do it. But they didn't do it. They marched somewhere else. Nobody cared. It didn't matter. Okay? But how that changed the history of Holocaust education is, for you older people in this room, What's the only thing you knew about the Holocaust coming through school? The diary of Anne Frank, I'd be willing to bet. That was the only source. And now these survivors are going to say, we need to let the world know what's taken, what took place. We need to let people know how evil and awful it was. Okay? And in the 19... 50s and 60s, even in the 70s, the Holocaust Museum in, in Illinois was in downtown Chicago and smaller than this room. And now there's a beautiful museum that was built in the 1990s out in Skokie. We made it through the history part. Are you all surviving yet? Still beaten? I don't want you to become a Muslim honor on me or anything like that. Okay. Okay. I apologize. I, I took this... I, I know Fritzy well. Uh, I've met her a number of times, but uh, she was doing a, a thing for a television in, in Illinois. She was, is the executive director of the Illinois Holocaust Museum. She was 13 years old when she and her mom were put on a train to go to Auschwitz Birkenau. When she got off the train, somebody speaking her native tongue said to say that she was older, so she said she was 15. And as a result, she was put in a line to go with working women rather than the children and the elderly that are going to be gassed immediately. Okay? She's working with 90 women. Okay? 
And she would tell you, as she told me, she says, you never wanted to be one of the first five or the last five coming in because the Nazis might pull you out, beat you with their gun, stab you, rape you, shoot you, kill you, have fun, whatever. But one day, she's coming in and she's fifth to last. And she's walking and she's stepping foot under the threshold of a building she'd never been in before when the Nazi tapped her on the shoulder and said, back to work. And the four girls behind her and she went back to work. And the other 85 entered that building, were gassed, and died within 20 minutes. That's how close to death this woman was. Now, another interesting thing about her, in 1978, she tells her husband, hey, if the Nazis are going to march, I'm going to be here, I'm going to be right there. And guys, oftentimes we don't get credit for being highly intelligent creatures. <laughs> and there's probably reasons for that. I know I've done a lot of stupid things myself. But her husband said, we're going fishing. <laughs> so I thought that was a pretty smart statement. Okay. Fred Lorber, rest his soul, he died two years ago. He was 93 years old. He's the only person I've ever met or will ever meet that saw Hitler in person as a 13-year-old in Austria. Hitler was holding a youth rally in downtown. He was on his bike with friends, and they'd bike downtown to see what was going on. They came back, and a couple hours later, the Nazis are knocking on the doors, taking all the Jewish men. His father's being grabbed. He, till the day he died, doesn't understand, but his mom had one arm grabbing him, the Nazis had the other one, and she's saying he's too young. And, but anyway, she was able to save him from going. And they were able to escape to the United States, and he went back as an American GI and fought against the Nazis in northern Italy. He was a great man. I miss him dearly. He was on the Iowa Council. He loved to do presentations like this and go to schools and, and talk. Phil Gans is another dear friend of mine that uh, used to come and speak in northwest Iowa over at Briar Cliff and in Sioux City on a yearly basis. His health is not allowing him to do that anymore. I still uh, wear his bracelet. We were able to get him to come to uh, Storm Lake because of Buena Vista University. And because he's in Storm Lake, I was able to get him to come to our high school of 67 kids <laughs> and speak in the gym. And I will, until the day I die, where he erase the hate. He would tell you, and this is a library, so don't do this, but if we could, he would say go to every book, every dictionary, and take that word out. How nice would it be to live in a world where hate is non-existent? He was 15 years old when he and his father ended up at Auschwitz-Birkenau. He's going to be a Sonder Commando, as is David later on. Sonder Commando is going to be a workforce where basically you're, you're searching through victims' goods for the stores, as well as taking the bodies from the, uh, from the uh, gas chambers, putting them on carts, and delivering them to the crematoriums to put in the ovens. He, he would tell you that the lifespan of a person at Auschwitz-Birkenau is usually two to three months. He and his father survived 18 months there. They actually survived to the point where in January of 1945, the Nazis are closing in. So what they did with all the people that were able to move, they started them on a forced march to the west, kind of a death march. He's going to wait. His father's going to die two weeks before liberation. And he's going to wake up in a field one day with it snowing by himself. He doesn't know whether the Nazis thought he was dead so they left him or the Soviets were closing in fast enough the Nazis just thought we got to get out of here for our own safety. But he weighed 65 pounds as an 18 year old. And for two weeks all he could eat was bread and milk. That's the only thing his digestive system could take in in a military hospital. His health is suffering. He may not make it to the end of this year. I'm not sure. Last I talked to his daughter, I was ordering bracelets, and she said he's not traveling anymore, and he's not getting around. And I talked about the Illinois Holocaust Museum and the U.S. Holocaust Museum. My students like the Illinois Holocaust Museum for... A couple of reasons. One, when I took my students there, they had a Jewish docent, a person that knew the museum, that took my kids in and answered questions as we're going through every exhibit. You're not kind of left on your own like you are the U.S. The next thing 
is that they are going to have a survivor. This is one of the survivors, Janine Oberman. Sit down with my students at a table, tell her a story and answer questions. Now, I taught for 45 years. I am certain that about 99.9% .9 of everything I try to get through my students is lost somewhere. But I can almost also guarantee you with 100% accuracy, people that sat with a survivor will never forget that till the day they die. Janine, interesting story about her, her family, they lived on the same street as Anne Frank. Her older sister and Anne Frank were very good friends. And she ended up getting shipped off to Vichy, which is in France. Now, the further west you were, the less likely you're going to suffer as much as the further east you go, the more likely you're not going to live. She showed us a picture, 38 family members. Three of them made it through the Holocaust. And my wife could testify to this, and it's heartbreaking for me to talk to you about it. But she's crying the whole time, isn't she? She just feels guilty for being alive. Why me? And I'd like to think, after all my years of education, I was smart enough to figure it out. But thank God I had my saint of a wife with me that day. Because she puts her arm around Janine and says, you're here, so you can tell that story to these kids. And they'll tell it to those kids. And they'll tell it to their kids. And the story won't end. And it did bring her some relief and compassion. That's my wife back there in the Iowa State sweatshirt. You can see she's really excited. <laughs> she's the saint. You can figure out what I am. <laughs> <laughs> Harold Cosimo is just down the road from you at Grinnell University. Okay. I worked on the Iowa Holocaust Commission for two years without knowing that he was a survivor. He never talked about it. As a matter of fact, I think I'm the one that got him to talk about it maybe the first time or second time ever. And he, felt, and he is a person of religious education studies. In October, he had a meeting with the Pope in Rome, talking about religious toleration and world affairs. He, he met with Pope John Paul earlier in his life as well. I don't know about you guys, but I don't think I'm ever going to get down and have a heart-to-heart -heart with the Pope, probably, or somebody that important. Okay? But this is a guy, at three years old, he and his mom and dad and older sister went into hiding in a forest. Have any of you ever seen the movie Defiance? Defiance is about the Belsky brothers living in the forest, trying to get Jews to safety. If you've read that, you may be interested. The I oh, can't think of the library right now, east of Cedar Rapids, an assistant librarian there, her grandmother was saved by the Belsky brothers. She was six years old. Paula's Window is the name of the book, if you're interested in that, if you haven't seen that. Okay. The father knew a man that had a cattle barn with a wooden floor. And he was able to convince that owner to allow him to dig under that floor to hide his family. Now, the hole is going to be deep enough so the three-and-a-half-year-old can stand up. Nobody else can stand up. And this man, from the time, for 19 months and five days, never left that hole. When he came out at five years old, he didn't know what grass or trees, he didn't know anything. They had a little deeper hole they used for human waste that the father would have to dig out. They had a tunnel from their place basically to what was known as a potato room that led to the house and that's where his sister, older sister, laid basically for almost a year and a half to two years. And his sister is not handling the Holocaust very well. I mean, he, she's done some writing and stuff, but I mean, he, he seems like an average person. I mean, I've had him come and speak to students in various places, but uh, he's, no, can't, I can't imagine. How many of you saw the movie Schindler's List? In the year, in the 1990s, Schindler's List became the new Holocaust education factor, replacing kind of the diary of Anne Frank. This is the youngest survivor of Schindler's List. She spoke at Valley. I met her there. I met her, I've met her twice and talked to her. Um, Selena Benez. Her interesting story is that 
in the early 1950s, when they were leaving the displaced persons camp, they had a relative in Israel and a relative in, New in Des Moines. They came to Des Moines. She graduated from North High School, and she went to Grinnell College. She lives on the West Coast now. She would tell you that almost everything in that movie was done historically accurately. Okay? The birthday party, the making of the ring to give to him, the papers they gave to him, uh, most everything. She was 13 years old when this happened. Another interesting thing about her, though, is her parents didn't work for Schindler, nor did she. So if you haven't seen the movie, what, what i got to go through real quickly, Schindler is uh, pot and pan, making pots and pans, and they're going to close the factory down. So he tells the Nazis, hey, I'll make armaments. I'll move my factory to Plotzkow. I'll move the factory, but I want my workers to go because they know what I expect. And so he starts making a list of about 1,100 people. You people are with me, right? Okay. Now, what he included in his list was 100 to 200 people from a friend of his who was a tailor. And her parents worked for the tailor. And she survived as a result of being friends with now, the other thing that you might remember from the movie is the men's train went directly to the factory, but the women's train got rerouted and went to Auschwitz-Birkenau, the death camp. She was 13 years old, and she was there, I think she said, for five months before Oscar Schindler was able to rescue his Jewish women and get them back. My last survivor, David Wollerman, his health is starting to recede. He's in a wheelchair now. His son is a pharmacist in Des Moines, Michael uh, and we're on the Holocaust Commission together. He was also a Sonder Commando. His wife was a survivor as well. She died three years ago. He's, I'm saying right now he's 94. I'm not sure when his birthday is. I know he was 93 a year ago, so he might still be 93, could be 94. But uh, very nice guy, great man. But as a Sonder Commando, the one thing I'll tell you that he witnessed he witnessed Nazis taking small babies and throwing them like baseballs against brick walls for fun to kill them. And his job would be to pick those up, put them in the crematoriums, put them in the carts and get them to the crematoriums. Uh, he ended up in a number, at least six different camps. And I about passed out when I found this out. He was liberated from Dachau on April 29th the day I have those pictures, he was liberated on that day from that camp. That's where he ended up at the end of the, the conflict. Now, how can we tie this in? Because so far right now, basically, this has just been a semi-boring, hopefully not too boring history lesson. Okay? But what can we do? When I started this program, this was school shootings. And then there was a shooting at a country concert in Las Vegas. And then there was a shooting in a Baptist church in Texas. And then there was a shooting out in California just this week. And another one. And then there were running over people with cars on the East Coast. So I changed it from school shootings to random killings. Now, how can we law-abiding citizens help avoid random killings or get rid of them? We need to be upstanding citizens, not bystanders anymore. We've got to, if we see things that are out of control, if we see things that don't seem right, we've got to let people know. If my neighbor's out back shooting M16s or AK-47s at pigeons or whatever, I'm thinking, that's getting a little too, that's getting a little too far. You know, I've got to let somebody know. I don't know whether they'll do anything about it, but I've got to do something about it. Okay. Now, as far as bullying is concerned, I always have trouble. Well, one of you two girls come up here, because you know what bullying's about. You've seen it in school. Come on, you just, come on, you can do this. I'm gonna try to help. I do, I, I do school programs, I do library programs, okay? You're gonna be the bully, and I know that's not in your nature. So you're gonna bully me. But here, I wanna I want teach you guys the process of what a bully is about, so. So say something to me that's mean. Come on. I don't know. I know. See, I have a hard time here. 
Jealousy? Well, just just make something. Come on. I know you don't mean it, so just just for the purpose here. I don't know. <laughs> you can you can be a bully. Come on. All right. Thanks. Thanks for playing. Hi. Hi. I got a real bully here now. Okay. Okay. Hi. Hi. You're fat. I know. I wish I was as thin as you. No, I don't wish I was that thin. But yes. Okay. So. Yeah. You're fat. You're ugly. I I apologize. This is the way I was born. I I wish I was as beautiful as you. (laughs) Keep it coming. See how hard it's going to be for her? I want you to sit down for just a minute because it doesn't take very long. (laughs) Seriously. What a bully expects you to do is respond in a certain way where he can make the rules of the game and it's all about power. You're allowing him power over you. Don't do it. Bully comes up and says, you're fat, you're ugly, you're stupid. Yeah, the other day she says, well, blue's not your color. I said, oh, I know, I wish I'd have worn red like you. And all of a sudden it comes pretty hard. I played college football and our fullback on our college football team was a devout Christian. And anybody that played football or rugby or stuff like that, at the bottom of a pile sometimes people aren't really nice. <laughs> <You're> like, <laughs> grabbing and punching and stuff. Anytime anybody did that to him... He would jump up, slap him on the butt as he's going back to the huddle and say, hey, God loves you. We'll see you on the next play. And those guys didn't want to see him again. (laughs) He is too weird. (laughs) No, I'm telling you right now, we cannot allow. We always had bullies in school. We've always had them. But now social media makes it so everybody in the world knows. And it's destroying people. And what we need to do is stand up to them. And not allow them to take our power away. And in the end, it may even change them. At least it's going to protect us. Now, human trafficking. You're not far from Interstate 80. I live at Ankeny, so I'm right on Interstate 80. Interstate 80 is the major traffic vehicle for all human trafficking from East Coast to West Coast going straight across the middle of Iowa. Three weeks in a row in our church in Ankeny, they talked about it one time. Uh, A task force person was talking, saying that they'd saved over 400 and some kids from being taken. Um, One time they said that all the hotels and motels in the metro area are getting together to try to figure out how they can help fight this. There was one time when a woman in a program came out and said, you'll be glad to know I just came through the Des Moines airport. And in the women's stalls in the bathroom are posters on every stall with numbers and things. If you're in trouble, if they've got problems or whatever, call this number. This is a real problem that we have. And you know that, and we know that, because we've had innocent lives taken within the last two or three months. We can wake up almost any day, look on Facebook, and you'll see a picture of somebody They say they're missing. Okay. So how can we deal with these problems? Every day we play these roles. In the Holocaust, a perpetrator, those are the Nazis. Okay. The victims are Jews, handicapped, homosexual, gypsies, all different groups that they don't want, right? Bystanders are people seeing it and allowing it. Upstanders are people like those people on those charts over there that are willing to risk their own life to do what's morally and justifiably right. And a collaborator. I'm going to, I'll use you two women if you don't mind. So you can stay where you're at. But here is a Jewish woman living in a neighborhood. Here's a non-Jew living in the neighborhood. Here's another non-Jew living in the neighborhood. And I'm a Nazi. And I'm going to ask you where the Jews are living, and I'm going to give you money or food or whatever, and now you're going to turn her in. You're a collaborator. And you know it's happening, and you don't say anything, and you're a bystander. These are both bad. Differing degrees, but both bad. They're both allowing this side of the world to elevate at the expense of goodness, kindness, love, and generosity, right? We can't be bystanders anymore. We need to be upstanders. There was a period of time where in the United States, you know, we kind of went and locked our own doors and just thought, okay, as long as my family's okay, you know, I don't care that much about the, I don't want the town to go down, but if it does, at least my family's, we, we can't do that anymore. The world is too small a place because of, social media and travel and everything else. Now, this is the last frame before we get to the movie. You hanging with me okay? Uh, Okay. 
How wonderful is that nobody need wait a single moment before starting to improve the world? Anne Frank. I took this from a park here in the United States. Kelly Ingram Park in Birmingham, Alabama. Now, some of you may remember in the 1960s in Birmingham, Alabama, it was known as Bombingham. You may remember that the police are going to call out dogs and fire hoses on young children, five, six, seven, eight, ten years old, who are protesting for civil rights. And I think it's only fitting that as we sit here and think about all those Nazis years ago that were so evil, this is right in our backyard, people. This is right in our backyard. Right. And when I saw the plaque, here's, an, here's another thing. As a history teacher, whenever we went on vacations, I drug my family to history locations, of course. <laughs> now my kids are growing up, they take their own family, but my wife still has to suffer with me. <laughs> when we went down to Florida for a family vacation, we went to the spot where Emmett Till was taken. We went to you know, Kelly Ingram Park and, and the Birmingham Museum and things like that. I just thought that's kind of fitting because isn't it true? We don't have to wait another moment to be better than we are, okay? I want you to realize one other thing. I'm no expert on the Holocaust. Everybody in this room probably knows something I don't know. I don't think there is such a thing as an expert on this topic. It's too broad. It's too wide. Every, I've met probably 30 to 40 survivors. Every one of their stories is different than the next one. And it's, yet it's true. I met a man that, after, after Kristallnacht, the British created a program known as the Kinder Transport. Some of you may have heard of that. They're willing to take in 10,000 from infant to 18-year-old Jewish kids as long as somebody in Great Britain, in England, will care for them. The government's not going to provide care for them. And I met a man that at six years old was put on a train by his parents. They said goodbye, and that was it. Now, for him, it's going to be a little easier than most. I can't imagine as an adult putting a six-year-old on a train and saying goodbye and sending him off somewhere. But he had an aunt that lived in England. They had visited her before. And the parents told him, we're sending you ahead. We've got some things we've got to do, and we'll be there shortly, which was an outright lie, but an easy way for him to get there. The second choice of choice I have occurred the last day I was at Newark. And I didn't get a chance to go up and meet this man and, and spend time with him. He was on a rush schedule. But he was talking about a nine-year-old boy and his father on the way to Auschwitz-Birkenau on a train. Now, if you've been at the U.S. Holocaust Museum, you realize those windows are about like this, and they're covered with barbed wire. You may have seen them on movies or something like that. But this man is talking about this <coughs> father and son and he says the father uses the last bit of strength he has to pull the barbed wire off and throw his nine-year-old son out of a moving train. That's his best of living. Choices, choices. The man speaking was that boy. He didn't have a living relative survive the Holocaust. And he was crying as he spoke these words. He says, I will never forget the last words my dad said. Be a good boy. Be a good boy. Two, two messages to leave you with. First one is, you're going to do something every day to help improve us, yourself individually. We spend so much time trying to fix everybody else. Spend a little time in devotion, however you want to do it, I don't care. Spiritually, mentally, physically, Make yourself the best you can be. You're coming, to, you're coming and being an audience for me here it humbles me. It truly humbles me because there are an awful lot more good people in the world than there are bad people, but we're letting the bad people win the game. I used to think that this site over here has to confront them and take them on and physically destroy them, but I've got a different belief. All we have to do to defeat them is elevate goodness. Elevate goodness so that the scale of justice starts to tip. And we can, and we can live in that world that we so dearly want to find. I, I thank you so much for being here. 
I truly appreciate it. Thank you. Anybody, any questions? Anybody have any questions? Like I said, uh, I'm the type of teacher, if I don't know, I won't BS you. I don't, I don't have it. I'm not that good at it. Yes. The Nuremberg laws, were they strictly for the Jews when they uh, drafted those? And the other laws that covered the Romas, the disabled yep. people later? Yep. The Nuremberg laws divided Jewish people into four categories of Mischlings depending upon whether both of your parents were Jewish, one parent was Jewish, both grandparents, one grandparent. But it didn't matter whether you were first, second, third, or fourth degree. If you had Jewish blood, that, that's what the Nuremberg Laws were doing. Yep. They were taking away citizenship rights and, and rights of Jewish people in the community. And others followed, like you said. Yep. Any other question? Yes. And why, why did Hitler pick on the Jews? I mean, why did that's he a pick question, on that, That's the question I kind of tried to... Um, one thing with certainty is that we know that they were angry at the Jews. They believed that they would have won World War I if the Jews would have put their finances and money into that effort. So that's one of the things. Another of the things is that there were a number of Jewish people on the Wannsee, or not the Wannsee, but on the uh, conference basically to create the new Weimar Republic. And, and it didn't work out. And so they saw them as failing. Um, Jews had always been picked on in history. They also believed that Jewish people were not truly German because their religion was more important than their citizenship. And they truly believed that most of them, given the choice, would want to move to Palestine or Israel. And so they thought they can't have it both ways. Um, but there are probably 30 things that kind of laid into it, the reality of it. But they just became the scapegoat for evil in, in Europe during this period of time. Okay. And, you can, and you can take it, like I said, go back to the Old Testament. There, there were stories that Jews poisoned the water that created black death. There were stories that Jews were killing Christian children uh, and using the blood of Christian children in their matzah, uh, their holy bread. I mean, all of those are false. But you start a rumor, here's, here's something, and this is a danger in society right now. You tell a falsehood a hundred times and a thousand times, and pretty soon it becomes the truth. And that's not the truth. It's still a falsehood. But we've got a problem with that. On all sides of the political spectrum, right, with finding the truth. When I was growing up, when you guys were growing up, if Walter, Concri Con uh, Walter Concrite came on TV and told me the news, that was the truth. You can't turn a TV channel on and find the truth anymore because it's about ratings and it's about am I liberal, am I not, am I conservative, am I pro-Republican, pro-Democrat. I mean, it's all somewhere the truth is there, but we've got to find it on our own and it's difficult. It's hard. And young people today, I, it's, it's a terrible situation for you guys to be dealt. So I, 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 I wish there was a clear-cut, real simple answer for that. I know people uh, oftentimes thought, well, his mom was killed at the hands of a Jewish doctor, which is not true. His mom died at the hands of a Jewish doctor, but he was friends with that Jewish doctor. And the Nuremberg Laws did not apply to that particular Jewish doctor because he was. So, I mean, from that standpoint, that, that was not one of the contributing factors as to why. But I, I don't know. And the country that was leading the study of eugenics during this period of time is the United States. But he, he does. He wants to create. And here's the funny thing about that. He wants to create a superior race, a blue-eyed, blonde-haired race, of which he doesn't have blue eyes or blonde hair. So if he would have taken that into account, we might not have had all this mess. He could have gotten rid of himself, and everything would be good. But you're right. He was looking to create a master race. He wasn't creating anybody like himself. Right. And he wasn't even German. He was Austrian. So, I mean, it's kind of, yeah. So, I mean, it's kind of, but anyway, kind of weird. Anybody else? Yes. Uh, do the families of the survivors continue to keep this alive? More so now than they used to, for sure. Yeah, I think. You know, like I said, for about a 20-year period of time, the families didn't even know the stories of their families. But now I think they are, are pretty committed to trying to keep this going. When I started teaching history back in 1975, there might have been a paragraph at the end of World War II saying the Nazis killed some 
Jews and, and other people, and that was about it. But in the history books I've been in, in the schools I've been subbing in, there's at least a couple pages or uh, uh, two or three pages or a section that's dealing with the topic. And I don't want this, I don't want you leaving today thinking this topic is dead. This topic is more alive now than maybe it's been in the last 50 years. There's more anti-Semitism and more hate publicly being displayed than we may have witnessed in my lifetime. And it's something that we need to be concerned about. We can't let this side continue to win the game, to, to take over the world, you know. Other questions? Yes? Didn't we in the United States limit the immigration of Jews into our country at that time? We, we did not expand our immigration policy, no. As a matter of fact, just to give you another example, the St. Louis was a ship that sailed in early 1940. And most of the passengers on it had visas to enter the United States in 1940, the next year. But we didn't let them on board. They, they, there were about six of the 900 and some uh, passengers that were able to get off in Cuba. We sent them all back. And most of them, except the ones that ended up in England, ended up in the camps and, and perished. Um, and interestingly enough, Jewish people yet to this day that I meet still see Roosevelt as a savior. Now, an awful lot of people in debate will say if Eleanor had been president, she would have allowed, shown more compassion and allowed more people and stuff. But you have to realize this. He's not able to enter a war to save Jews with public opinion in the United States the way it was. Secondly, and I've been told this by many experts and many people, it's pretty difficult for one country to tell another country how to treat their citizens. You're taking away their autonomy. And I've been told that there's only two reasons in the history of the world why it's been done. One is political gain. One is economic gain. Oil, maybe that's a good enough reason. Who knows? You know, but morality doesn't seem to be on the front cover of that. So it's pretty sad, but yeah. So anyway, yeah, we did not expand our our quota there. And uh, there were an awful lot of anti-Semites, especially in the State Department and in the, in the federal government that, that he was having to deal with. So, but uh, anything else? Thank you for being here. Like I said, I'm humbled by your appearance. Thanks.